So welcome to the 21 online participants of this moment. Um, my name is Verena Winiwanta, as you can see in our printed program, and I'm the chair of the Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Um, and as we are today in a Kerner von Marilaun Symposium, I would like to use the opportunity to say a few words about Kerner von Marilaun, um, because he is, I think, better known in many places than in his um, own country, Austria. Now, if you are interested in, in his um, memory, you can go to the Wiener Zentralfriedhof after and not instead of the symposium, of course, uh, because he has an honorary grave there in group uh, O number 22. Um, he was originally um, educated as a, as a physician. He obtained a doctorate in uh, medicine in 1854, and he was actually working as a, as a physician for a while. But then he became professor of botany after his habilitation in 1858. Um, and that was actually in what is now um, Hungary in Ofen. And he also became professor of natural history at the University of Innsbruck, where one of his lasting legacies, he started a collection of alpine plants in the botanical garden there. And if I were to go through his entire uh, career, we would stand here for quite a while. But I would like to point out three things who, which might be interesting in, the, in connection with what we are discussing today. He, he, has an, he, his, he gave as, an, um, as a legacy to the University of Vienna, where he then became professor of systematic botany, a, an herbarium of 120,000 species. And one of the things that we realize nowadays is that everybody talks about the sixth great extinction and the changes that we see in all our ecosystems, but without these old collections, we could not assess these changes. Um, and it is to the credit of the botanists of the 19th century to have understood this and collected um, these specimens. Phytogeography and phytosociology are the fields which were basically formed by Kerner von Marilaun. And I, I brought a quote by him to you uh, before I close this welcome. He said, and years pass by until a second generation of plants can develop stronger and richer on the prepared soil. But restless works the plant kingdom and constructs its green building further on the corpses of perished roots, new younger plant forms germinate and so it goes on in tireless change until finally the shady treetops of a high forest murmur above the humus rich soil. So you can see that he had an idea of, um, of, a, of a botany growing steady until it reached a climax stadium. We now know that the world is even more dynamic than Kerner von Mariland was thinking of. What is true today and what was true in Kerner von Marilaun's days is that foresters never know what will become of their interventions because trees grow slowly. And this made foresters, I think, one of the first societal heralds of the changes that were brought about to forests by human intervention. And I'm just mentioning forest dieback from uh, acidic emissions as one of the great points where the modern forestry made an important contribution to what I would call a human ecology or a social ecology. And 
As a commission for interdisciplinary ecological studies, I think we're aptly named after, we aptly name our, our symposia and workshops after Kerner von Marilaun. Um, I am really happy that due to the Austrian Academy of Sciences being financed by Austrian taxpayer money, we can offer you this symposium today. I hope that it will be fruitful and that it will be actually bringing forward ideas how to seed the future sustainably. I would like to thank the conveners of the symposium, Georg Grazer, member of the Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies, who will, who will also speak to you, I think, right after me, and uh, Mario Pesendorfer, who was, I think, instrumental in getting it all together and who will also guide you through this morning. Um, I think that if you read the IPBES reports, it is pretty clear that everybody who can should work on a more sustainable future, not just for humans, but also for our terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. And I hope that some of you will be better able to contribute to this necessary change after having learned from this symposium. Georg, the floor is yours. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks, Verena. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure actually to, to be here today and, and speak to you. And, and I love that you, uh, you selected the, the quotation by Kenneth from Maryland. I'm using the same one in, in, in my courses because it shows that he actually had a very good idea on, on succession, for instance, way before Clements and, and, and all those, you know. So, um, if an oak, and we all like oak trees, don't we? If an oak in each of its hundred offsprings would produce hundred offsprings, we would uh, get 10 to the power of 19 uh, oaks after 10 generations. And mind you, we have, we have something like uh, 7 to the power of 22 stars in the known universe. Hmm. Taking this textbook book, uh, example on exponential growth, then why care? Why care about seeds? Well, we're all aware that this is not really how the world works, actually, and, and functions, that there are evolutionary reasons for why trees invest resources into high number of seeds over long, long lifespans. And actually, our distinguished speakers here are amongst those who know best about these reasons and the mechanisms behind fascinating phenomena uh, of mass seed production often synchronized over whole continents or parts of continents called uh, so-called musting and the driving factors. But there's really more to why we are meeting here today. And Verena mentioned this already, and, and I'm not sure, you may have seen uh, Rockström et al's uh, paper published something like two weeks ago in, uh, in Nature, that has a quantification of safe and just earth system boundaries uh, that are globally exceeded for seven of the eight of these safe and just earth system boundaries. And um, we all know and we actually paid for knowing about these uh, threats. Uh, we all know the threats that we are exposed to and will be exposed to uh, in terms of transgressing these um, kind of safe, safe spaces. Well. Knowing this and being aware of our responsibility towards uh, society, we try to make, with this workshop also, try to make a small contribution to navigate through uh, the turbulences um, until we get back into karma, waters through political action. Then what would that mean for our topic? We will be confronted with uh, an increase of forest disturbances, extreme events, um, both in terms of frequency and, and intensity. This creates really an, an increase in the demand for tree seeds in order to restore and, and regenerate these uh, disturbed sites. And the, you might have seen that, um, at least uh, the Europeans, uh, the EU forest strategy for 2030 postul postulates 
to plant at least 3 billion additional, additional trees in the EU until 2030. At the same time, we get reports from our seed producers that quality and quantity of uh, the seeds are actually going down. And it, we would require some more tools for uh, forecasting and managing tree seed production. And yesterday, we had uh, in the framework of this symposium, we had a whole day workshop actually, where we work together with stakeholders, with seed producers, with forest administration and, and scientists. Um, and we aimed at improving our understanding of the Austrian tree seed production system. And we created a causal, uh, a participatory causal loop diagram uh, where that actually showed us a first glimpse of where the levers are uh, that help us safeguarding the future or may help us in safeguarding the future of our forests in terms of uh, seed production. And it became clear not only the, that the, the integrated systemic perspective is just at the beginning to emerge, uh, uh, but that the open ecological questions also uh, on the mechanisms of seed production hold high relevance for the seed producers, for, for the practical uh, foresters out there. And you see that we are trying to break really disciplinary boundaries and collaborate with stakeholders, um, something that we think is in strong accordance with uh, the intention of these kind of on Marilon workshops. And we also try to leave our cozy, self-defined scientific sandboxes, maybe even remove the boundaries and see how it plays in new and more open spaces that realize that knowing is not enough. Well, with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Mario Pesendorfer, who really, has, uh, as Verena already mentioned, has done an outstanding job of bringing all you, all these top class speakers and the distinguished audience here together to Vienna and setting the course uh, to the, for, for the event, together with a great team of the Academy of Sciences, Dr. Viktor Bruckmann and Karin Winsteig. So a big hand to Mario and, and, and uh, Viktor and the whole team. And Mario, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome our online participants as well, as well as everybody that made their way here to the Academy on this beautiful morning. Uh, we are so lucky to have one of the most beautiful weeks in Vienna yet this year. Um, I really decided not to uh, say much in terms of content because we will have so many impressive talks coming up. And um, I feel like I was able to leave my mark by inviting some of my favorite scientists and it is an incredible privilege to do so. I um, therefore am left to say thank you to many, many people. I want to start with the Academy of Sciences, uh, the Commission for Interdisciplinary Ecological Studies for providing this opportunity. Uh, for a young researcher like me, it is an incredible, almost a dream come true that I can pick my favorite authors and ask them to come join us here in wonderful Vienna. And it has been incredible working with the team, both at the academies, Dr. Victor Bruckmann and Karin Winsteig were mentioned. There are other people working in the background and also on our side. So the PhD students in our projects, our administrative support at the Boku and many people were involved in making this happen. So I'm very grateful. Finally, I'm grateful to the speakers and all the visitors that they have made their long ways from around the world to come here and that they're willing to participate in the workshops around it. Um, so we we'll start a little early, which I think will be helpful to do uh, longer discussions behind the talks, which gives us a little breathing room. And uh, I think without further ado, I'd like to ask Thomas Wolgemuth, Dr. Thomas Wolgemuth from the Swiss Federal Institute for Forest, Snow and Landscape Research in Zurich, Switzerland, uh, where he leads the research unit for forest dynamics to come tell us about the insights on how to keep current forests fit for the future, 
lessons of extreme events, surveys, and seedling experiments. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the kind invitation by Georg and Mario. I'm very happy to be here. Also, I'm very happy to be <laughs> to give an introduction on this kind of Marilaun uh, symposium. Uh, I have a book uh, of 1863 of Kerner, and uh, this is in my bookshelf. I adore him. Um, this was among plant life in the Donau uh, Länder. There are many plant lives. There is also a plant life of the Alpine space by Karl Schröter. Before it was plant geography, afterward then it turned to plant sociology and then to vegetation science, in short. <laughs> so actually, I, will, I won't give you some um, intensive information on seed production and seed must uh, events, but more transformed seeds uh, based on how to keep the current forest fit for the future. This is a very big subject. Okay. Um, a forester in Switzerland, if he has to decide what to do with the forest, needs to ask different questions. Where do you come from? Who are you? Where do you go? This has been taught for many years, for decades, by Professor Hans Leibendgut, that was at the ETH Zurich. And actually, we look at the forest here um, in the state of 21, uh, in the low elevation site of Canton Schaffhausen in Switzerland. And actually, this is only the whole, the, the half truth. This was what remained after this forest. So we had this very severe hot drought in 2018, and the forest looked different at that time. One year afterwards, we had a high mortality of this forest by about 60 to 80 percent of the adult trees. In 2020, it looked about the same, but then the Forest Service decided in 21 to cut down the dead trees out of security reasons and what we see now are actually the survivors and we see the piece the, uh, the wood in pieces uh, from the declined uh, beaches so this was a beach that was affected and it was not only in switzerland affected there was the same effects also in germany in big parts of central europe um, we then traced uh, some of these beaches, 961 in detail. Uh, we started to monitor them in 12, uh, 2080 and continued until 21 for four years. We did this uh, in the northern part of Switzerland, uh, different places, and we distinguished between the discolored trees in summertime and compared them to the green trees at that moment in summertime, so meaning that they would uh, let fall their leaves in fall. So we found that from these trees that were discolored already in summertime, that about um, five to 10% of them died during the next three, four years. And this is a conservative number because much of the uh, observed trees were cut down before they died off out of security reasons. So we might think that this number can climb to 20%. Also, we considered or estimated the mortality in the crown. This is a combination measure of uh, transparency and uh, um, dead uh, branches. And we found a number of 20 to 30, 35% after three years after this event in the crown. So the crown looked quite different now. Um, there was like a reduction of this crown mortality because the trees started to sprout, re sprout at, this, at the stems. In contrast, the trees that were green in summertime, they, had, they showed like a normal mortality rate of 1 to 2 percent, and also in mortality, they were different. So, discoloration of these beech trees in summer indicates a predisposition of decline on dry sites. This is quite special, um, exceptional, because uh, if you are thinking that these drought events will happen more frequently in the future, this means that the old trees will suffer more and more, and this might be like a change of the tree composition. 
Well, if you're talking of these more frequent events, I can show you a new um, study done by Mauro Hermann in collaboration of the ETH and WSL. And in this study, we compared, uh, we, we looked at Europe from the sky and we analyzed Modi's Terra satellite data with a pixel resolution of 220 meters. We considered only forested areas. Um, we considered only the time span between June, July and August, so summertime. So this is a idealistic picture showing Europe in summertime without clouds. And it shows like a green pattern. And we then uh, applied a greenness index that normalized difference vegetation index applied to these cells. We aggregated these cells to a higher uh, sizes of 40 by 40 kilometers and then uh, defined a threshold upon, uh, above which we decided the area to be green, uh, below which we decided the area to be brown. Um, what are the reasons for such uh, color differences? One could be bark beetle outbreaks, one could be wind throw, uh, one could be uh, forest fire events, harvesting also, and one could be early leaf discoloration in summertime. So and this is the result. And let's focus first on the first line. Uh, in 2003, so this was up to recent the most beautiful summer in Central Europe. Everybody that can remember this summer uh, has good feelings on this uh, period of two or three months of beautiful weather. And we had actually almost no damages on the trees. There were at the forest edges, for instance, but they were not in such a number that they changed the greenness from the sky. We can continue this picture, um, let's say in 2005, we can stop here. There was a big uh, summer fire period in Spain and we see large areas in red which means these areas turned to brown somehow. We can continue in 2006 again some forest fires then also in southern uh, France, uh, seven also more in the eastern parts some forest fires 2008 then in Turkey and there was a quiet time between 2009, 10, 11 um, without any big damages or brown uh, forests. And then we can continue, continue, continue until 2017. I was in vacation in Tuscany and I can tell that the red areas are actually a uh, brown forest that turned brown because of extreme hot drought in that year. So the forests in the Tuscany were brown until 500 meters above sea level. And uh, this looked quite um, Unconvenient. Uh, 2018, then these pictures came back to temperate Europe for the first time in such an extension. And in 2019, somehow evolved to bark beetle outbreaks in the eastern parts. And for instance, between 2018 and 2020, France was affected three times by extreme droughts, as such that the brown areas somehow dominated this area. And then there was 2021, a wet time in all Europe almost. And then 2022, this was like boom. So it was the first time when the Mediterranean area and the temperate area was affected in such a dimension. This was the first time. I don't know since when, but at least since the last 21 years. And I cannot remember during my lifespan that I have ever experienced such an outbreak of, of impacts of, of uh, summer hot drought. Well, this is a, a new situation and I think it will continue. We are now again four weeks uh, in a, yeah, the no rain situation started four weeks ago and the, the pastures are turning to brown again and we will see. Um, what has this to do with our forests? Um, this is a picture showing uh, the current composition of forests. This is a model because we don't have a mapped area of the whole area in Switzerland, but it just quickly shows the system of the forests um, we have. We have it in lowlands, the beech trees. Uh, we have at higher elevations, such as in the Jura Mountains. I cannot point here. 
possible to fly it? Ah, it's possible. Yeah, at a higher elevation, we have uh, the coniferous trees in the Jura Mountains, the silver fir in the central parts of the Alps, uh, spruce, silver fir, and in the inner Alps, the Scots pines at higher elevations in the inner Alps, the larch, and in the south of the Alps, we have beech again dominating, then chestnut, lime, and neophytic species at the lowest elevation. Actually, if we now model the new climate and the tree composition, we clearly see that our forest uh, types will shift upwards. So this is basic knowledge at the moment, but also it shows that we have about 20% of the forest area of this non-analogous climate. This means we have at this area also in the future non-analogous tree composition. So where to take the species that form our future trees, our future forests. This is quite a um, substantial problem. And we see already now at exactly these regions that our trees are somehow declining, be it in 2019, 2018, uh, now during the last two years, more in the central parts, in the southern parts of Switzerland, uh, declining um, forest vegetation at lower elevation. So it already has started. So is it also visible if we look at the, sign, uh, the Na uh, Swiss National Forest Inventory that started in 1880? Yes, it is possible. We can see the declines and the changes in stocks, for instance. This is a, uh, a graph, this is a quite new one, uh, of the stock situation. Uh, we have a total stock of, in average, this is the black line, 350 about cubic meter per hectare. This is the highest level of forests in, in all Europe. So Switzerland has the oldest forests in, in average. And we see that in average, these um, stocks are more or less the same during the last 30 years. But we also see that the red line, this shows the central plateau. We see a strong decline in the stock. This may have different reasons, and this is also not so easy to explain. One reason is more harvesting. Another reason is Lothar. This was a big storm event in 2000 that created a lot of damages, and it had to be harvested, and trees are slowly growing, and stock is some more declining than increasing. But also during the last five years, from 2018 to 2023, uh, we have a strong decline. And this is because of drought. Um, at other parts, and, and we also see this decline in the uh, Jura Mountains. This is the uh, third uh, top line uh, in light blue. We see a clear decline. This is also because of drought. So, so, so we see quite a, a nice signal on the stock situation. In contrast, at the alpine areas, we have an increase of the stocks because of continuous growth of the old trees that are not easily accessible. So then a second graph, uh, the uh, bottom graph shows the number of dead wood trees. So these are all trees that are dead, be them standing or lying around, and they are increasingly uh, they are increasing since 30 years. Again, here are different reasons for that. Um, one reason is nature conservation. So it, we were aware that trees have to be, that dead wood is a habitat too. And this is like a nice, um, a nice thinking. But we have, during the last five years, between LFI 4 and LFI 5, these are only five years, um, of period, uh, the other ones are 10 years of period, you have the same amount of increased number of deadwood. And this is caused again by, uh, in the lower elevations, by drought. So this is really amazing how our forests look at the moment. They look different uh, than the situation in my youth. Really, we have so much more deadwood, and much is uh, impacted by this drought situation. So what are the problems of our forests then? If you look at the real current tree composition in Switzerland, 
um, you cannot detect any patterns, it's too complicated, but just watch the numbers. We have about only 43% of natural tree composition of the canopy. We have more than 50% of unnatural composition. And what is it about that? Um, we have too much Norway spruce. This is related to the past. We have too much European larch. This is also related to the past, but at higher elevations. At higher elevations, there were the classical pasture forests. So they were, it's, it's like embedded in a, um, in a in an agricultural tradition, but in principle, more Norway spruce at higher elevation. So it should be there. So. How does it come like this uh, too much amount of Norway spruce at lower elevations? This is caused by um, the primacy of timber production during the 1850s to the 1950s when industrialization took place and everything was growing. So er everywhere there were plantations of uh, Norway spruce, also in the lowlands like here in the canton of Zurich. And it was replanted over har after harvesting again with Norway spruce. And so uh, this is the situation that we have high amounts of Norway spruce Norway spruce, even now. Norway spruce are very suspect, uh, susceptible to winter storms because uh, wind can blow them down in contrast to the uh, deciduous trees without leaves. And this is shown on this picture. Um, it should be a silver fir beech forest, but it actually was a Norway spruce forest. And the ones that survived this uh, winds row were the beeches without leaves in the winter time. Um, there is also the problem of the Norway spruce that are affected by bark beetles. This is well known. Actually, by higher temperatures, the regeneration during one season in summertime uh, will double by higher temperatures. And this, of course, will affect almost all Norway spruces at the lower elevations. So um, even though... Uh, even if we would not uh, account for the drought, but if we only account for the bark beetles, this will be eaten up by these bark beetles until the next century. So what are the remaining tree species? So how do the tree species uh, that are um, named principal tree species in Switzerland? So from left to the right, I ordered the species according to the amount in the Swiss forests. It is indicated by the stock at the y-axis. And we see that uh, Fagus sylvatica, European beech, is declining during the last two years, or at least at the Jura Mountains. And there is no further increase of the uh, stock in the central plateau where most of the species are standing. Castanea sativa uh, was hit by uh, Castanea blight, uh, uh, um, a dieback um, that were, is caused by a fungi, and this uh, date, dates back to already 30 years ago, and since then there is like no change in the stock. Then uh, Fraxinus excelsior uh, ash now showed the, the first absolute clear signal that this tree is really uh, on a wide area declining because also of ash dieback. And then Quercus species, uh, even though this is uh, the, the, the clear future species uh, and promoted by everybody, um, this tree is more declining than increasing in stock. If you look in detail, uh, the pubescent oak in the central part of the Alp is profiting from the decline of the Scots pine. So this is like a vegetation shift from Scots pine that is declining to more uh, pubescent oak. In the lower line, we see uh, Pizia abias declining in general in whole Switzerland, but in um, uh, the most uh, effect, uh, impressively in the lowlands in, in central plateau, the red line. Then abies alba, this is a positive species. It is increasing in stock, even though all foresters complain about browsing effects, but it's still increasing and it's therefore probably correctly named the future species. Um, and then we have Scots pine that is declining almost in all areas in Switzerland. And um, 
Well, this is really uh, a surprise, uh, but since the last 30 years, it's obvious that the, this extreme summer drought and also winter drought uh, events somehow caused big declines in waves. So again, I come back to this time scale of, of um, forest uh, silviculture management in Switzerland. And here it comes a very important message that since 1991, we have by law a close to nature silviculture. This is also the reason why I do not talk too much of seeds, because actually we do not seed forests, we do not plant forests in masses like in Austria. We really uh, have the premature of, of uh, close to nature silviculture, which serves, which of course has to alimentate the forest services, wood protection, recreation and biodiversity. But then we have climate change. And now uh, more and more some new concepts are popping up. Closer to nature management, adaptive forest management, climate smart forestry. So this is more than only close to nature silviculture. And Right now in, the, in, in Switzerland, there is a big debate, um, yeah, how to change the situation. And I think we, uh, we cannot omit to adapt to this silviculture, to, this to adapt the closer to nature silviculture to opening to plantations. So this is in effect what we have to change. And I focus on the different points that, uh, that uh, adapted close to nature silviculture really uh, is. I uh, focus on including selected non-native and non-analog uh, trees in non-analogous regions and also to integrate the non-native genotypes by assisted migration or assisted plantation. And yes, I give some pictures of must. <laughs> because they are since two weeks. <laughs> so we have a website where we publish now this mass situation based on models and observations um, of different tree species. And yeah, well, we see that the alternation of Facus sylvatica until 22 and the last two years there was no big mast, uh, almost no mast. We also can subdivide this or uh, detail this information by elevation. So at the right bar plots, we see the elevation from low to high elevation. This is uh, interesting then for the next uh, species I show. RBS alba has different patterns from year to year. It's mostly also alternating in, in the low elevations, but not so in the higher elevations. And uh, more clearly, this is shown in PCR RBS that is, uh, has different patterns, but uh, clearly shows different levels of mast uh, production, uh, seed production at higher elevation at, at lower elevation. So there are diff two different patterns. The ones at the higher elevations have longer periods between mast situations. But of course, I wanted to point out that we need to monitor our forests in different uh, aspects, different conditions. So this was the message. And next, we also uh, need to do experiments with new species. So this is a new uh, experimental design, uh, an experimental plantation, where in all Switzerland, about 59 experimental sites are installed. Each of them has a size of one hectare. And uh, at these sites, um, six to 18 different tree species are planted. And each of these species is uh, repeated by seven different provenances from southern regions. So we can compare the growth of these trees and genotypes uh, during the next 30 to 50 years. The aim of this project is on the one hand to have these comparisons and on the other hand to have also seed trees when we need them. Um, in total 50,000 seedlings were planted and it's there are now one or two years in the soil so the project is starting. We use um, the native species and we use some um, non-native tree species like Douglas fir, Atlas cedar, uh, Turkish hazel and turkey oak. 
And at three places, we also do like an experiment in polytunnel greenhouses. So we um, mounted these houses uh, in which we have elevated temperature and different types of rain adding. And we compare here turkey oak, atlas cedar, douglas fir, three future tree species that are non-native but non-invasive uh, with European beech, silver fir and sessile oak. And first results are popping in day by day. We are uh, monitoring the phenology of these tree species and clearly we see differences in the tree species in the phenology, meaning that they have a longer uh, growth period. And by this, I come already to my summary. Uh, for finding the best suited trees for our forests, we need to monitor the growth conditions of forests and trees. That means that we need to know much about the past and the present condition of these trees by national forest inventory, long-term forest ecosystem research, survey of resistance and resilience. And we also need checks for the impacts of non-natives on native ecosystems. We need to check the impact of the future conditions by experimentally testing impacts on the future growth conditions on the performance of tree species and provenances. And we have also to rethink the forest services. This means we have to consider drought, more drought resistant species in our forests and uh, also defining or deciding whether to uh, include or integrate the non-natives uh, or the and non-invasive so we wish we get rid of the non in of the invasive species but the debate has started in switzerland how to do this and there are different opinions of course going in uh, direct different directions and this is the debate that is going on okay and with this i thank you very much for the attention Check. Ah. Thank you so much for this presentation, which I think laid a very important foundation for uh, the other contributions that we will have today. And um, the way that we will do questions is we have a large online audience. I don't know how many people are online now, but hopefully more than... Okay. 36 people are online, and so I will mix questions from online and from the real audience. And I will take the first question from the audience that already came during the talk, which was, do you think that vegetative regeneration will become more important, such as coppicing, etc., if periods of drought become more prominent? Aha. Uh -huh. You mean uh, to reduce the rotation time? Yes. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's evident this is, this is one, one option to do. And it's obvious also, it's, it's good for the resistance of, of the trees and forests against storms, for instance. But on the other hand, we have nature conservancy. So we also have these islands of old growth and to do nothing in, in these areas. So we have like two competing systems. So yes, we probably will do both. So it is one of the strategies that may contribute. Okay. Yeah. Then do we have any questions from the audience? Could you please come with the mic? Oh, I'll do it from here. Thank you very much for this overview, which was also, I think, very, very helpful for somebody like me. I'm an environmental historian. I work sometimes with Matthias Bürgi, so I saw his name and was very happy about it, but I'm not, I'm not an expert. But what I know of the history of Australia and of introductions of species into Australia, and what I know of the introduction of eucalypt trees into places like Spain is that all these well-meaning, non-invasive, non-natives are a mixed blessing. And you said that op opinions were divided. What I am wondering is which kinds of pest insects will be you know, living and thriving 
under climate change and, and then might endanger your, your tactics here? Is that, is that a part of the consideration? So do you work with entomologists and think about this? Yeah, I, I intensively work with Martin Gosner, who is the expert in this field. And uh, we just finished, uh, completed a publication on this subject on non-native tree species in Europe. And um, of course, there are many studies and th the most uh, biggest unknown factor is really if there is an insect or a, a, um, an ekrankheit that comes from outside and uh, some of the non-natives is then the host. We don't know what then happens. So this, this is the most danger. I think the most the biggest rich, uh, risk, I think. On the other hand, the impacts of some of the non-native tree species are to some extent überschaubar. Um, <laughs> it's not so, so Douglas fir, for instance, um, it's astonishing that uh, if you only add mixed such a species, impacts on biodiversity is really small, I would say, and soils are not really um, impacted too much by no on on poor sites yes there are some studies on that but usually in switzerland people are only planting these on rich sites so yes we can control for this but on the other hand we also have these forest services like wood production which we clearly see a decline in not only the stock but also the increment decreased so you yeah, have some problems so you uh, inadvertently answered a couple of the online questions which were about neophytes inhibiting forest regeneration and the need for more alien species to be brought into Switzerland. So we will take the next question from the audience. Thank you, uh, very interesting talk. Uh, but of course, coming from New Zealand, uh, you know, we know about invasive species. We know what we shouldn't have done. And I was a bit surprised to see um, Douglas fir on your list. Douglas fir was brought to New Zealand and for the first 30 or 40 years didn't do very much. And then I think it got the right myco mycorrhizal associations and now it is very invasive. It will invade native forest because it's shade tolerant and it's actually just replacing things. And New Zealand is spending an awful lot of money controlling Douglas fir now. And that sort of leads to a very interesting question, I think. And it, it, in a way, it's quite a brave approach, what you've outlined there, I think, because you, you're talking about uh, the sort of novel and existing species. And I think there's a philosophical question about if we want forests in Switzerland under climate change, do we have to accept they won't look like the old forests? Maybe it'll be Douglas fir and it'll be completely different, but it's trees. So will we have a situation where we have to say, we'll take the exotics because it's forest, because the forests we had before will not cope? Um, presume you're thinking about all of that, those kind of philosophical questions now, are you? Because if you put Douglas fir in there, you're gonna, you're gonna have to deal with that. Yeah. So I know that Douglas fir is considered invasive in Chile, in New Zealand, in Australia, and it isn't in Europe. Yeah, it's a great timber tree and it really depends if you plant it poorly or if it admix it only. So it's not only allowed to admix it in Switzerland, we have only 0.20% of the area covered by Douglas fir. It has been introduced 150 years ago, so it is standing in tall exemplars in many forests. It looks, yeah, it looks great in a way different but but quite impressive i would say and uh, but we don't have it in 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 pure stance so this is the difference so i think we can handle it in a way we don't can we cannot handle this these insects that fly in and then well this is the problem but it also can happen for the natives so but we have a problem that we have at lower elevations, like not the, the fitting trees at the moment. So we have there a problem. And the problems do not come from my side, for instance, but they come from the cantonal foresters, the foresters that really have to somehow care for the forest services. What to do if the climate is too rough, harsh, that the, the normal native trees are not able to cope with? It's, yeah, it's, it's philosophical. 
perhaps I can also add the Austrian perspective where spruce dominates the landscape and may not have done so uh, centuries ago. And uh, so it's, when you look at the forest when we travel on Saturday, uh, that's a perspective to keep in mind. We have one more question from Dr. Pierce. In the slide, considering non-analogous climates, um, in what context are they non-analogous? So is that climates that weren't previously represented in Switzerland or within the um, ranges of the trees that are relevant to Switzerland or just not, not at all on Earth? <laughs> so this is more or less a bit uh, the same, <laughs> that for a long time this tree adapted to the climate, to the temperate climate, and now if we consider the, the new climate, for instance, in Geneva or in Basel, we have to go to Bordeaux to find the, the analogous climate, or even we have to go to Rome if we add five uh, degrees warmer temperatures, then we have to go to Rome. And trees there have in the long-term equilibrium a different composition. We are talking then of Quercus elix or something else. Yeah, so, so I guess it's a mix then of within or without or outside of the range of some of the species. Like in Bordeaux, you'd have Quercus robur or something possibly still in that area. Yeah, but, but you also have Pinus pinea yeah, or Pinus right, pinaster. Yeah. <laughs> so you have different trees that are, do not occur in Switzerland. And then we have on the north side of the Alps the problem that frost does not vanish, so disappear. We always will have frost because we have no uh, mountain system between the polar system and the temperate Europe. So frost can happen every, almost every winter time. So we need some frost resistant trees. This is the difference to the Mediterranean climate. So the climate is not really analog. Wonderful, I think that wraps up. We have one more question from Dr. Grazza. <laughs> No, no wrap-up yet. Uh, well, thanks, Tom. Uh, looking at the NDVI data that you showed, it looked like the Alps were actually less affected, you know. Uh, did they have more orographic rains or so? And do you see, uh, do you see an amplification of extremes like uh, in, in the Alps based on site conditions, northern slopes, southern slopes, particularly southern slopes on limestone that may become more dry and then the northern slopes that may actually be less uh, dry than, uh, than, than the flatlands and so on. So do you see this amplification in relation to that? I was wondering in your tree breeding uh, program that there are no, no really very uh, drought resistant species like, I don't know, Sorbos aria or something like this, you know. Uh, do you think of those and, uh, and having them for such extreme sites? First of all, the Alps are really a, a, like an island with, with more rain. And it could be seen in the last year. I traveled from France to back to Zurich and along this trip, all France was brown. And then I entered Geneva by the borderline and it turned green. And I was quite astonished, but it was really the effect of the Jura Mountains and of the Alps where there is more rain. And so it, it's for some while it will be this island uh, with more rain but it can change it, it, it's uh, climbing up this this drought events more and more and so regarding disturbances we have now with the storm via the first time that a big storm hit the southern part of the alps usually this the winter storms come from the western part over the Atlantic and hit then the first countries along the Atlantic coast and then go somehow uh, over the temperate zone of, of Europe. But now it's the first time it turned the other way around and hit also the southern parts of the Alps. This is a new event. Uh, I don't know how often this will take place. And for the trees, uh, Novi spruce will be more affected by uh, warmer summer temperatures because of this uh, higher number of regeneration by bark beetles. So uh, really the foresters in Switzerland are afraid to see more of these bark events, bark beetle events. All right, well, thank you so much for the extensive answering of the questions. Please, one more round of applause for Dr. Thomas Wigemann.
Next, I'm very pleased to ask to the stage Dr. Stephanie Bethmann, who's the head of the Societal Change Unit at the Forest Research Institute of Baden-Württemberg in Germany, the Institute of Forest Ecology at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences Vienna, and they will hold a dialogue about knowing is not enough, sociological contributions to applied forest science. Hello everybody, Stephanie and I are thrilled to be here today and to share some research approach that is influencing Stephanie's empirical research and also mine um, during the FOREC project. Because in FOREC we focus um, on examining the future applicability to produce tree seeds on small to middle scale farms. And these are farms that are not exceeding five hectares in size. But this tree seed, these farms are embedded into the Austrian tree seed system, which we define as the harvest, production, supply, and distribution of tree seed and seedlings within a forestry and agricultural system. And within the system, many actors are involved. And however, today we will not focus on this tree seed system um, because today we will go beyond these explorations. We will dive into the realm of social ecological systems and taking on a sociological perspective to truly understand the bigger picture. Now you might be actually wondering why does sociology matter in the context of seed production? Um, we often associate research activities like the foresee project research with the biophysical world with ecological problems. But to guarantee a sufficient supply of high quality tree seeds um, that are fairly distributed, it's crucial to recognize that it's not only a biophys biophysical challenge, but it is also a social one. Unfortunately, in many natural science projects and monitoring projects, social sciences are often an afterthought, merely added to the picture and um, to convince people to accept certain practices. But Stephanie and I today propose a different role for sociology in this context. We believe in coming in early and to positively complicating the research problem. Social ecological systems are inherently complex and sometimes messy. But we, oh sorry, back, <laughs> too early. But we argue that the more problems we can identify, the better we can focus on finding the right solutions. So today we invite you to a journey to embrace the complexities of and the details of a social system so that we can truly make a difference to understand and shape the future of the tree seed production. Uh, Stephanie, so I think it would be here good that you could also make some theoretical assumptions um, about the sociological perspective we want to present to the audience today. Okay, thank you. So, um, I've got a second. Uh, break, okay, break, break, break. Uh, yeah, I would love to do that, uh, Martina. <laughs> uh, we present this as a dialogue um, because I'm actually not at all an expert on tree seed production, uh, other than from what I learned from the workshop yesterday. But uh, I'm a sociologist who's long been working, or the past 10 years, been working in transdisciplinary research in applied forest sciences. And so I yeah, just want to share some sociological concepts that I have found to be fruitful and useful in this context. And then we'll together find out how this applies to the FOSI research project. Um, I think maybe this goes down a little bit. Yeah, um, Martina has already pointed out that there are a number of social phenomena at the core of FOSI's research interest. And I just want to add some, uh, yeah, one more aspect. And that is that um, the very research problem that you formulate, like this idea that there might be a potential shortage of resilient seeds that you want to produce knowledge to counteract against is, of course, uh, a problem that is formulated from a human perspective and pointing at human needs and desires. And so the first assumption that I want to share is, 
um, that everybody, uh, that every problem is somebody's problem, so that we have this perspectivity of pro social um, problems within any, even scientific research problem. Um, and sociology can play the role of um, getting a fuller picture here by understanding this problem from different social points of view. So we are actually on a mission to help create a problem that relevant actors within the fields will care about, that is compatible with their values and worldviews, and take serious their knowledge of the problem. Not meaning that uh, you want to like um, adapt their values and worldviews, but you should better know about them uh, in a transdisciplinary research um, endeavor such as this. So this already leads me to my second assumption, which is the diversity of knowledge, a sociological notion of knowledge. Um, the title of our talk is Knowing is Not Enough, but it would have been more accurate to say that there are all kinds of diverse knowledges that you might want to consider in such a research. And um, all this yeah, knowledge always only answers to problems that we have. And so again, it is tied to these social worlds. And uh, to take our dialogue to you, I want to ask you to take a moment and think of a forest that you care about. Maybe there are some forest owners in the audience, Everybody has a forest, I assume, uh, who they care, that they care about. What do you know of that forest? What is it that you know about it? We do, yeah, I'll just take this one example up to exemplify that, I mean, uh, we do not have the time to hear like all of your thoughts, but I want to um, start with this one thought and uh, make an educated guess about other thoughts that might have been in the audience. And tree species, that points to, for example, scientific knowledge that many of you have of forests, those who studied forestry or who still study um, in this research field and work in it. Um, but then there are also other kinds of knowledge that you might have um, gone through your head, such as very personal and incorporated bodily knowledge that you just have of the forest that you know so well that are attached to your personal experiences. So a knowledge of experience that's not necessarily a scientific one. There is knowledge that is discursive, that circulates in a scientific discourse so that you um, can explicitly discuss with others, but parts of your knowledge is more intuitive, more implicit. And that is for a profession such as forestry, it is usually the larger proportion of the knowledge that we apply in everyday life and in work life is implicit because it's become incorporated. We can't really say how we know. So the diversity of knowledge is um, quite huge. And I wonder, Martina, whether it is maybe important for you uh, to incorporate that in your research project, um, but also how are you going to do that and what the challenges for you are? Um, yes, that's right. Is it right? Oh, yeah. That's right. Um, in order to do so, in 4C, we apply quali um, various qualitative methods like interviews and, and workshops to truly to, to address the system actors' um, knowledge, um, perspectives, and viewpoints. Um, but I think it's also important that we collaborate on that a little bit more. Um, what can be quite tricky when we focus on these certain actors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, focusing on actors actually is rather tricky and it's not an easy task to research that. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the challenges that I have often found in applied forest research and our ecological transformation research is that actors are sometimes viewed um, first of all, as recipients of scientific knowledge. So the construction of the actor is, um, would they only know better, they would act better or they would act accordingly. And the role of science is to supply this kind of knowledge. Uh, a second dimension of how we view actors very often is that they are homo economicus. So they tend to act in their own best economic interest and we want to manipulate them through economic incentives. This may in many cases very well be a clever approach. However, as a sociologist, I must challenge both definitions of an actor. And um, yeah, first of all, I said knowledge is not enough, also meaning that knowledge drives action only when it is also tied to problems that people have, only when it is tied to their worldviews, um, and when it resonates with their, their life experience and is not in extreme contrast to it. This would be one um, challenge. 
And that also already points to the shortcomings of the concept of homo economicus, because people act on all kinds of drivers other than economic interests. They act on values, norms, habits, self-perception, identities, and I think we all have often um, yeah, seen that to be true and sociology has often proven it to be true. And so I want to just um, suggest another concept of um, how we are looking at actors through the lens of the idea of a practical sense, it goes back to the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. Um, and you can imagine the practical sense as like the sum total of all the knowledge, all the habits, all the beliefs that guide us in our orient, that orient us in our everyday actions, be it in our profession or be it in everyday life. Yeah, um, that's the challenge. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, my thought was that isn't it a huge methodolo methodological um, challenge? Because the practical sense is by definition implicit. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot really ask people um, to explain it because it's everything that is taken for granted. For us, that means we have to delve really deep into the world of these small to middle scale farms and forest, forests um, to truly understand um, the practices and the habits that they are in. So, um, shall we give the audience some empirical example? Yeah, I hope that they are curious to hear one. <laughs> um, um, I brought an example from forest work, so it's uh, a related field to what you are discussing here today, I think. And um, it is actually a, from a study on work safety in forest work, and I'm not going to present these results, but I just want to show how and why we study the practical sense in forest work. So that's going to be my empirical example for you. Um, first of all, uh, a methodological footnote. Um, well, we used group discussions, so that is a qualitative research methods with um, those forest workers. And uh, actually, um, it's quite a time-consuming, uh, especially time-consuming analysis of the data that we do. Um, and also, in the discussions itself, we didn't just like cut the cut down to the chase and just ask the forest workers for their opinions or their identities. No, we had them tell us about their biographies, their passions and their everyday work lives and from this we connected some dots. These are the dots. First of all, forest workers are not homo economicus. Um, the interviewer here says, well, forest work is one of the most dangerous professions and his sentence is being finished by a member of the group and that is why the salary is so high and he gets some laughter from the group. Because obviously, it is safe to say that economic rationalities are not central to this choice of work. At least in Baden-Württemberg, there are many better paid employment opportunities. Uh, well, what does motivate the forest worker? They often speak of the occupational path in terms of vocation and a way of life, a preferred way of life. So they loved being in the forest from childhood on, uh, and this continues to today. They often have um, also forest work as a family tradition. It is just taken for granted for them that this is a way of life that they want to uh, live. And one of the drivers of forest workers here is also their extreme love for forests but it is not just any forest that they love. It is a normative ideal of an orderly forest that they follow and their self-identification is they build, their, their professional pride is in building such a forest. So I have another quote on this for you. Well, we have quite a lot of responsibility in what we do. We are the ones within a young stand who make the choice which trees to cut. It was us who built this. So they see themselves as architects of forests and landscapes. Now, um, also in Germany, in Baden-Württemberg, in the state forest, uh, in recent years or in the last decade, there was uh, like new management procedures were introduced, including natural regeneration of the forest instead of planting and uh, old and dead wood concept. So this alters the procedures of forest work, makes it a more passive approach. Um, and also, uh, of course, it alters the workplace of the, of the forest workers and makes it more dangerous in some respects. Mm, so what do the forest um, workers think about that? If we are lucky comes regeneration, if not comes blackberry, two meters high. This is not a forest anymore, this is a pig pen. So this is an extreme statement, of course, that I picked, but what I want to point out is that um, scientifically based new concepts that are being introduced in management can be in conflict with 
the drivers of professional action. Also, forest workers feel, because all this has been implemented very top-down, that they are being misrecognized in their important role in building forests. Another rather extreme quote, um, they view us as stupid, strong, water repellent, and all-terrain. So, as mere tools or machines. So, we have a huge conflict here between the self-identity of the forest workers, about what they love about their work practices, and as a, lack, as a result, we find that there's a lack of identification, going both ways, as a matter of fact, and shadow work practices that are being established in forest work. And this is a huge barrier to ecological transitions, because those are the people who are down there in the forest every day with a chainsaw in their hand, and also a work safety hazard. And I thank you for following me on this detour, because a detour it was. And I want to give back to Martina, um, who will translate these ideas to Fossi. Thank you. Um, oh, there is. Well, we are still in the middle of preparing the research material, material. So here I will refer to some considerations from, um, from agricultural and forestry sociological research that is helping us to identify the relevant problems when it comes to examining the applicability to produce tree seeds on farms. And I want to talk also about the practical sense-making in this context. And in your empirical example, Stephanie, you refer to the individual self-identification with a certain profession. Well, farmers too tend to self-identify with certain workspaces and holding concepts. And still, that's very important to keep in our minds. 90% of all Austrian agricultural and forestry holdings are family farms. And their agricultural activities and, and decisions such as the division of labor, the purchase of machines and devices and uh, other production methods, they can't be reduced to rational decision-making approaches from the neoclassical economics, uh, economic approaches. Rather, we really need to take into account the individual rural lifestyles, family-centered projects, which in turn are then embedded into these natural environments and also into social networks. And many decisions of farmers that have to be made on this daily basis, they are very diverse, sometimes very conflictual, and these interests of the so-called agricultural holding household um, network are partly incompatible. Okay, so let's apply this information again to the examples of existing and maybe future sources of tree seeds. Of tree seeds, tree seed stands and tree seed orchards, but in the context of agricultural holdings. Um, for the management of seed stands, the classic division of labor in family farms in Austria must be taken into account. Accordingly, often the older generation withdraws from workspaces at the farm into the forest management. That raises important questions, just like who is actually responsible in this forest, and then also in the potential tree seed stand. And are these practices that are related with the approval of this tree seed stand or uh, practices to harvest the tree seeds and, the, and, and related to the, to the supply, are they compatible with existing forest management practices and purpose? And the challenge here is, can the responsible person identify with these new practices? And then also a very important question is, how well connected is this person to the to key actors from the current tree seed system, just like foresters, um, consulting officers, uh, control officers, consultants, harvesters, tree climbers, or to tree nurseries. And if we now focus on the tree seed orchards, it's crucial to point out that farmers um, hold various perspectives when it comes to ideologies. And here we define ideologies as linked beliefs that are coupled to a certain holding concept, um, depending on how and what they actually produce. In 4C, we are interested in the applic applicability to produce tree seeds in multifunctional farming systems, for example, agroforestry systems. 
but certain values, beliefs, and habits are also often associated with these multifunctional forms of management and can be in stark contrast to previous management practices on existing examples of the tree seed orchards or existing ideas how to manage these orchards. So let's imagine bundles of practical senses collide here, which are reflected in the way the orchards are managed. Okay. Um, okay. It's not on. It's on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Martina, I think the qualitative uh, research approach that I kind of exemplified will be very helpful to delve into some of these questions. But then for those of you who were at the workshop yesterday, um, you might remember, I think you were going one step further in your research and uh, applying um, participatory methods in order to come to these shared problem definitions. What is your experience with that so far? Um, yeah, that's right again. <laughs> um, yeah, yesterday's workshop um, was really about to come to a shared understanding of this, I already mentioned it further, um, in the beginning, the tree seed system. And what is very important that we, I think, we came to shared problem definitions. In this context, I also have to say that um, no farmers were included there yet, but that will be also the next step for this research to make workshop or again a workshop with farmers um, to then also together generate um, applicable solu solutions to produce tree seeds on farms. But now I would like to sum up. Um, sociology is a toolbox of theoretical concepts of methodologies that help to, like I said in, in the beginning, to positively complicate the research problem. And to do so, we suggest to use sociology in order to include diverse standpoints and knowledge, to come to shared problem definitions, and to develop applicable solutions. And with that suggestions, I would like to end, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was very insightful and um, really helped uh, me reflect on yesterday's workshop as well, uh, where I, I quote a tree seed harvesting operator who said, we are the ones combating climate change. We are the ones changing the forests. And this ownership and this uh, attitude that this is a, a product of their labor really impressed me and makes a lot more sense now that you have uh, sort of organized this knowledge for us. So first, I'd like to take a question from the audience, if there are any. Yes, Elizabeth. So I very much enjoyed your presentation. And it was interesting for me to think about, because in our research, we work a lot with homeowners in the United States and whether they plant lawns or flower gardens in their front yards for conservation. And with homeowners, one of our guesses, although I've never met the right social scientist to work with to know how true this is, is that the simpler the guidance you give them, the more likely they are to follow it. And I wonder if that might also be true with foresters, that if you tell them here's a complicated new way to do things, no way. But if there's some simple changes that they can make and you're telling them to do something new, not to stop doing what they love, if that would give you incremental ways forward and what those ways might be. But, yeah. yeah, it's a really, really cool question because, uh, well, we suggested to complicate the problem, but sometimes we have to keep it simple. And uh, I think one, one maybe major role in so, uh, rule in social life, like a ground rule, is that we are always very, like, change doesn't come easy. So the, the, the large majority of all our days is ruled by habits. So this is, of course, one way to, um, to accomplish change by making change uh, as small as possible. Another would be to change uh, relevant environments that like, produce different kinds of habits. So not uh, go at the actors to change, but change their environments in ways that makes it easy for them uh, to um, yeah, behave differently. Um, but then also I think sometimes um, when scientists present easy solutions, 
this can also be tricky because when it's not compatible with like the worldviews, it's also not very well. It's it's rather likely that the solution that you present will not be entirely true or truthful, you know. No, but but actors can be very, I think, um, uh, very susceptible to that. They they would easily uh, realize, and so uh, yeah, I I think it's it's worth a try, but it must make sense um, and be a fitting solution also. I would also say I think it's worth to um, take the effort. Um, to apply methods we also talked about. Um, if you could, yeah, collaborate together on certain applicable practices, that would also help to kind of increase the acceptance and they feel appreciated and accepted. So. Thank you. Um, there's a question from online asking, uh, is there any way to include citizen science in the project? And if so, how? I know for C project. Ha, huh, yeah, that's something you can also ask yourself um, tomorrow in the workshops. Uh, <laughs> no, but, um, well, yes, I mean, yeah, added to the monitoring concept for sure. I mean, that's also something that Yeah, depending on when and on what can be observed, it can be, I mean, citizen science can be uh, applied on various stages of a research project, very early when you are framing the research questions and then delving deeper into collecting the data um, for the monitoring. Yeah, if you have certain data that can be collected quite easily, um, or is good explained and, and, and the scientists also uh, decide that it's um, then valuable data um, that could work as well and um, yeah, so. Just for clarification, one of the ideas that we're working on as part of the Forest Seed Project is how to develop a monitoring system for seed production and associated phenomena that can be upheld, upheld for decades to come and so citizen science may play a role there. And I think, Stephanie, you also wanted to say something. Yes, I wanted to make a connection to Tom's talk uh, in the morning where um, he told us that um, well, there's quite the public debate also coming up around such things as whether we should plant trees, whether we should have assisted migration and all these issues. And this would certainly be a reason why including or thinking about including uh, citizen science in, in such research might be a wise choice, actually. And I think citizen science really works only then when the researchers also want to learn something, really, from the people that they invite to participate. And then it can also help to have a shared, like, for the whole public debate to develop shared understandings of the challenges that we're looking at. Thank you. Now, Dr. Vinivatna. Thank you very much for this fantastic talk. I really enjoyed this. I would like to encourage you to stop talking about that you make it more complicated. I think you make it more realistic and more adequate. I think that we should point out always when doing interdisciplinary research that disciplinary research never is adequate uh, if, it, if there is any real life problem involved. Um, I think that what you said in the discussion about sense, it must make sense, yeah, is I think it would be a Luhmannian approach to, to this question. Um, People do what makes sense to them. And I think we have to get into this process of sense making in order to change practices. And one very important dimension, I think, is gender construction. And foresters are still a very manly pursuit. I mean, the race, they raise the most phallic of species, if you allow me this. But they also, and, and I'm going Levi Strauss and, and Mary Douglas, they also create a sense of order. And I think that we need to get into the question of ordering, <clears throat> ordering nature as a very manly pursuit. And I was talking about Kerner von Marilan, you could also mention Linné, yeah? you could mention taxonomy as such, as one of these big, civilizational projects of making order out of nature. 
end happily by killing nature, yeah? Um, which is a herbarium, by the way. So I, I do think that, that you are working also along a gradient of appreciation of different types of knowledge, where the scientific knowledge is valued much higher by politicians than the sociological or any social science knowledge is. And I think we also need to work on that. But I can only encourage you to keep doing it. And, and this was, I think, more a comment, but my, my question would be, what about the gender dimension? Would you dare doing it? Absolutely, thank you for that question. I actually don't get it often, and I'm very glad to get it. Because I think it's rather, I mean, in forestry it's almost pretty obvious. <laughs> and um, yeah, what I just want to point out is that there is like a growing field of research on understanding forest work and understanding forestry in terms of care relations, caring for nature, caring for humans and non-humans. And I find this a very interesting discussion because I think it also shows that like you, you presented a, I think, very accurate analysis <laughs> in a few words of like this masculinity or this masculine self-identity of the profession and also maybe of the sciences in part. Um, uh, and, but then when you look at the practices, as a matter of fact, and when you look at the emotions and the effects that are implied in it, of course there's much more to it, whether women or men are um, caring for forests. And I find it very interesting that this is being picked up at the moment. And I think we'll have quite the um, yeah, social science discussions on this uh, in the next years. Um, and I also, what's also fascinating is that we live in a society where our constructions and ideas of nature are, of course, also gendered. Um, and uh, so that behind a lot of things that we fight about or that we, we are discussing about what changes are going to, to be made, um, there are actually questions of uh, relationships of humans to nature, uh, human non-human relationships, and uh, we also must, maybe not in a sh short talk like this today, but we also actually should always also delve into that because it's what lies behind a lot of the uh, conflicts that we find. Thank you. One more question, Dr. Gatza. Thanks, really. That's uh, so inspiring. And also in, in relation to what, uh, Verena, you, you just said about the valuation of knowledge. So what I learn is that my implicit assumption that my scientific knowledge is actually the more valuable one wouldn't really work. Uh, would you agree there? Uh, so that is maybe something, yes, you would probably, <laughs> Verena. Uh, that is maybe something that really, I mean, I have to think about when uh, trying to... Um, to get ideas across, you know. So this is really something that I will now uh, carry on. But in relation to that, uh, types of knowledge, and Martina, you have done quite a few uh, interviews already. Do you think, I mean, do the, in, in, in your, in how were your impressions, do farmers love tree seeds? Do they love it more <laughs> than, uh, I don't know, cows or uh, maize, you know? I mean, the truth is, uh, I didn't have the option yet to actually talk to farmers, um, just some informal talks. It seems like it's still an alien field for them. So it can be quite interesting. Um, yes, I mean, some farmers are um, working in the field of um, plant seeds. So that's some relatable field. Um, and, and, and yeah, so... I cannot really tell because, but I still have the feeling of for, for yeah, the talks I had, the, the small informal ones, it looks a little bit um, far away still from their worldviews. But I think because of that, uh, it's very important to start that approach also with workshops to really discuss how it could be then applicable or how how they could imagine to produce tree seeds in their existing farming concepts, um, to imagine, uh, yeah, to, to make a shared imagination of how that would work. Well, thank you so much. Please give one more round of applause to Stephanie Bateman and Martina Perzel.
I'm now very pleased to invite Dr. Katharina Bucke to the stage. She works at the Austrian National Public Health Institute, and she will tell us about how monitoring and forecasting of annual forest processes is useful to public health. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me. So I have the pleasure to introduce you or to give you some insights into my research work. I've done with my colleague Franz Rubel, who is also in the auditorium. And, but seeing this under the public health classes, because I changed my affiliation to the Competence Center of Climate and Health at the Austrian National um, 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 Public Health Institute, sorry. <laughs> so maybe to introduce a little bit the Competence Center in just a few words. Um, we are part of the Austrian National Public Health Institute and we are a very interdisciplinary team. So in my person, I'm actually um, a meteorology by training, but I'm worked in the field of epidemiology. We have a lot of social scientists in our group, uh, but as well as economics. And uh, together we want to bring uh, our expertise from science, from policy, from practice, to the interface of climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, to the health promotion and health care system. And we have three main focuses. So one focus is on the climate neutral health system, as the climate health system is producing greenhouse gases by their self. And we want to train them a little bit how to reduce this. Um, we also have the area of co-benefits, which means health promotion actions also uh, have uh, climate change mitigation um, aspects. And um, the main focus I'm working on is climate resilient of the health systems. And to go a bit deeper into this area and then to bring you to the uh, tree aspect and tree masting aspect, um, a climate resilient of health system is um, is uh, conducted by several building blocks of the health system. And one of these building blocks is the health information systems. And here we have the vulnerability and adaptation aspect or as, uh, assessment, but also the integrated monitoring and early warning systems and the health and climate research so that um, evidence-based decision-making can be done. And if we have a look on the different mechanisms of the climate change to our health outcomes, then we can start here with the... Ah, yeah. <laughs> we can here start with the Earth system or the climate system, which is changing. We have different mechanisms, and I also have introduced here few uh, bubbles for your side, for the tree uh, reproduction, because I missed it a little bit. And then the different disease or health outcomes. And if we are talking about tree product reproduction, then there are two major health outcomes or diseases. On the one hand, we have the allergies, which are environmental introduced, and also the vector-borne diseases. Um, maybe a few words on the allergies. They are um, due to, uh, to the changing of the pollen season, which starts earlier, less, longer, or more intensive, more allergies um, are expected. Uh, we have here, I have a diagram or a plot of the difference of the, uh, I think it's the breach and the olive trees. And when uh, it can be seen that in the Alpine region, these two trees uh, start um, start earlier with pollen, um, pollen production uh, 10 to 20 days earlier than 40 years before. And this is from the Lancet uh, countdown. So this is an uh, indicator for Europe on the outcomes of um, climate change on, the, on health. So joining a little bit more to the vector-borne diseases and vectors, which I uh, worked a lot many years on, uh, climate change condition or changing climate condition help on the one side uh, for invasive uh, vector species, which can establish in new regions. So they are typical, the mosquitoes, Aedes albopictus or Aedes japonicus. But also these temperature changes affect the behavior of the vectors, that can extend the transmission seasons and the spread of tropical or subtropical diseases in our um, 
regions. And you have here a picture of this uh, combined uh, between hosts, vectors, and pathogen, and all it's caused by the environment. And to come a little bit, I want to tell you something about the beauty of the ticks. <laughs> Maybe, I'm, you know, I'm a meteorologist. I, I learned to like them, <laughs> to love them. They are very famous because they are capturing every year the headlines. So I have some, we have collected a few um, um, words. So each year is the worst tick year ever, actually. <laughs> each year it's getting even uh, harder. Sometimes it's also in German, but uh, the ticks catching people. <laughs> so they are very, very dangerous, actually. Um, but our research question was, is this, realis is this realistic? And um, maybe it's, uh, some few words on ticks. You see, they are beauty. <laughs> um, when we are talking about ticks in Europe, we are mainly speaking about Ixodes ricinus, the casted bean tick. And uh, it's widely spread in Europe, and it's the main vector for tick-borne encephalitis, the Trebek virus, or different Borrelia, Burgdorferi, or Babesia diver uh, divergensis, which cause Lyme disease. There are several other um, 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 viruses sorry, <laughs> found inside the ticks, but they never have been proven for vector competence. So, if you want to collect or monitor the tick species or the tick density, then you have to go outside in the wood. Um, this is a, a student of mine. She's collecting the ticks under with a standardized method. You see, she's dragging a white flannel over the leaf area and um, the ticks grabbing on this flannel and then you turn off the flag and can collect the um, ticks. Uh, the um, um, flag is one by one square meter, and you do this for 100 meters, so you have in the end a tick density of 100 square meter. So it's a tough uh, job actually because when the mosquito start, season starts, it's not so funny. <laughs> so a few more pictures after you have collected in the wood, then you have to data mine them um, with your. With, it, with the help of a microscope, it's much easier to distinguish between larvae, nymph, female adults, or male adults, so you can define the different stages and um, count them. When I was preparing the, uh, this talk, I also found this picture. Oop. This is uh, um, a tick under a micro CD, so you can also go inside the tick. So, Ticks are quite fascinating. But uh, coming back to the um, beach fructification and the tree masting, so how we can use now the information you give us about the trees to say how many ticks there are and to maybe to be more serious than several headlines, the ticks are coming. So the question is, what is the link between the masting and the tick? And it's another animals, it's small rodents and also larger animals, uh, mammals. And I have uh, some picture here to uh, um, describe it a bit more, the influence of the beach masting on the nymphs or the tick species. So when starting with the beach, and we have a year with beach masting, then this is very attractive for rodeos or also wild boars, because they are feeding with this. But on the same time, all ticks taking blood of the rodeos and the mammals. So the next year, the year after, you have many larvae, so the next stage. But together with the beach masting, you also have many, a large amount of small rodents. And the small rodents give the blood for the larvae. So two years after, and after molting, you have many nymphs. And with this many nymphs, then you have an increase, or you can observe an increase in the human inf in tick-borne infections. So we can say there's a two-year two time lag, and it's also the nymph density is also uh, defined by the temperature, so the mean annual temperature of the last year and the mean weather temperature. 
Uh, we tested our hepatitis uh, for an uh, area in Germany, in the tick space is called Haselmühl. <laughs> Not a very well-known uh, place, I guess. <laughs> but I think it's the most inve uh, investigated um, tick-borne <laughs> disease a spot in, in Europe. So the, uh, our colleagues, um, Lydia Chitima Dobler and Gerhard Dobler, collecting ticks since 2009 regularly uh, each month. And we took their um, time series and uh, developed a model to, def uh, to predict the annual nymph density. And we only took three parameters, or it's, it's only needed three parameters. We need the mean winter temperature. So the temperature between December and February, the annual mean temperature of the previous year, and the beach fructification two years before, as I have shown you. And we got it from the Bavarian State Institute of Forestry, so we get an indicator of the, of the beach fructification. And you see, our model uh, fits quite well. If you have remember, and you are the experts, when we have been the masting years, who knows it? <laughs> it has been in 2016, in 2011, and 2009. And two years after, you always can see a peak in the nymphal density. So by taking, uh, having this time lag enables us to do some prediction each spring, because we have uh, the, the parameters. And here you see our I think we have done five predictions each year. And you can see it in red is our, are our predictions. The gray bars are the observed tick species. And you see there's a quite good prediction. We have an, only an area of, I think, 10%. Only 2020 is a bit different, but I think everything was different in 2020. Um, yeah, so now we know the tick species or the tick density. And this and helps us going back to the public health classes to inform the people. We can inform them and say, this year there will be a lot of ticks, be aware of ticks. But another inf interesting thing is we would like to forecast tick-borne encephalitis. So we want to uh, um, predict the incidences. And we have developed a model for Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. And I will give you a short overview uh, of the model. So maybe starting with what is tick-borne encephalitis, it's um, a virus encephalitis. And over the years in Central Europe, it's uh, rising over decades. Here you have the time series for Austria, Germany, and Switzerland starting in 1990. And you see there's a slight uh, uh, increase, but you see this interannual differences. So you, have, you can see the peaks uh, are more or less in the last years. So in Austria, we have the highest case numbers in 2018, 2020, and 2022, although around 80% of the Austrian population is vaccinated against TBE. A similar picture you can see in Germany and Switzerland. In both uh, um, countries, the maximum values, which are historical maximum values, um, the, um, observed in 2020 but we only can estimate the vaccination rate, which is, but this, which is uh, much lower than in Austria. The Austrian vaccination rate is so high because uh, there's some, some historical reasons because the vaccination was developed in Austria. So when we want to, <laughs> when we want to explain this time series, we start here with the Austrian time series because this was the first model, model we developed. We split it into several parts, into several steps. First of all, we uh, wanted to explain the trend of the TPE incidences. And the trend can be explained by the human population in uh, growth. But um, if you have a look to the power spectrum, you see there's a peak in three years and in 10 years. So we need some indicators or predictors uh, for explaining those uh, time shifts. And one of the 10-year um, uh, impact can be explained by a large-scale atmospheric circulation pattern. It's the so-called Scandinavian index, which is an index um, 
derived from temperature and precipitation over the Scandinavian area, which also affects Europe and the Russian weather. And if uh, this Scandinavian index is very high in July, then we have a cold and moist summer. So this can be introduced in the model. And as I mentioned before, also the three-year oscillation, TBE oscillation, can be explained by the beach fructification. So here again, we have this time shift of two years for the nymphs, but three years for the um, TBE incidences. So putting this into this uh, model, we can explain the TBE cases by the total population, the Scandinavian index, the net migration rate, the beach fructification, and then we have also some short time um, observation, and this is um, because of the human behavior, so joining the, the forest, so we also include the sunshine duration. And you see, we, with this model, with these five different predictors, we can really um, model the TBE cases quite well. So again, we want to uh, make some forecast, as this is the heart of the meteorologist, always wanted to do some forecasting. So with, again, with, the, uh, with this time lags, we can make pro, um, uh, forecasts. Here we have the forecast for 2020 and 2021 uh, for Austria. You see the, in gray, again, these are the observed um, incidences. The red ones are the modeled incidences. And here you see our prognosis. And here I have written it down. The real data for 2019, it fits quite well, but as well as for 2020, but again, 2020 was a bit different. Um, so the people go outside to the wood because they have free time. Um, again, we have done this for Germany and Switzerland with uh, similar uh, results. And you see 2020, 20, was observed as a, with a high incidence, but we also can forecast uh, is with this high incidence. So maybe to sum up this little bit, uh, for developing models for risk assessment, we need, uh, first of all, defining this uh, whole ecological system. So the system between hosts, vector, and pathogens, and the effect of the environment. And we need certain input parameters. And here we are on the right address. We need the data on the mast seeding. And I was happy when Mario told me in the morning that they're also working on the predictions of the mast seeding because this can be a predictors, really good predictors for our models. And finally, help us to prevent people for, for tick-borne encephalitis by, by side of the vaccination. Yeah. Maybe some uh, further reading I can um, refer on to our publication. And I would like also to mention our homepage. You can also go through it, the QR code. Uh, here we have all our publication, but also some uh, R codes. So if you want to calculate it by your own, you're welcome. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation and I will take the privilege of asking the first question. You're welcome. So, one of the things we're very interested in when forecasting is the forecast horizon. Yeah. When does the probability of our prediction uh, being accurate rise above chance? You know, when are we better than just guessing? And my question is, when it comes to uh, predicting tick abundance, is it really when you have the seed crop or can you tell a little bit earlier already? Um, actually, it's the seed crop, which is the main predictor, the main predictor which uh, lasts two years back. It's always the question of temperature. Yeah, um, the tick life cycle goes for three to five years, so this is a very short, so we cannot predict it very long. That's really fascinating. How about some mm. questions from the audience? Thanks. Um, that, was a, that was a brilliant talk. Um, super you. interesting. Um, so several times you mentioned this special year, okay, where things 
went a bit wrong for different reasons. Um, Not wrong, different. <laughs> in, yeah, in society generally and, um, and in terms of your forecasts. Um, so it would be interesting if you could perhaps just say a few words about how that is an illustration of um, how sometimes when we have forecast models which are um, developed based on kind of past data sets and then the kind of parameters change, the situation changes, how does that affect the way in which we can use forecasts, for example, in public health? So for example, you know, how does that impact on your ability to forecast and convince policymakers next year? And yeah. like, what are, the, yeah, what are the kind of broader lessons that can be drawn from those occasions when it goes wrong for reasons that you couldn't have forecasted? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what came into my mind when you're asking this question was, during my study, uh, one professor told me, as long as um, a coin is uh, worse than your prediction, your prediction is good. <laughs> so, this, um, um, of course, there are so uh, always, um, how can we tell it? Um, with a model, you can always only predict or uh, describe a process which is already known. So it's always difficult to do some forecast of processes with, which you don't know, which effects you don't know um, some different um, parameters or predictors have on your system. But you have some kind of idea, and having this, we, we, you have also the trend. If you, if you have seen uh, in 2020, uh, the tick uh, population as well, the TBE incidences are increasing. So the trend is quite clear. Only the number of was a bit different because of the um, different situation, let's call it like this. Um, so we have the main uh, predictors identified. So and the next steps could be uh, for uh, making it more clear and more define it more. Thank you. At this point, I also want to encourage our online viewers to submit questions in the boxes below their video windows. Okay. We have a next question from the audit. Oh, then Davide, point. Thanks, Katarina. David Ascoli from the University of Torino. I will look at ticks with different eyes. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, so you love them as well. <laughs> Uh, if you can just go uh, a bit deeper in, uh, in the model yeah. you built, so you said the seed production two years before is the best predictor and is uh, measured, collected by the forest service in Bavaria. And so probably our seeds counts coming from different sites. So you use like uh, an indicator of seed production at the whole regional scale. Is it all right? Yeah, we, we use it from the Bavarian uh, forest, but we uh, um, compared it to I think it was the Swiss and also for some Austrian areas. So they were all correlated. So we took we say okay, we are fine with the Bavarian indicator. Yeah. So the specific question was: Is the extent of the synchrony in seed production is a relevant process uh, creating the scale for infections? Mm -hmm. So if you went down in this process and, and see if the spatial synchrony create a, a scale that upscale the infection. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We will think about it. <laughs> okay, yes, another question. <laughs> okay, to elaborate on the social science applications a little bit more that we heard before. So let's say you predict a high tick-borne disease rate for next year. What would then be your strategies to pr um, prevent a high tick out uh, rate, a Lyme disease outbreak, as, or, or encephalitis, sorry, as I'm sure that vaccines are the primary form of safety measurement? What would then be your campaigns or strategies? Would you try to convince people to get more vaccinated? Or would you, well, discourage them from going outside, or what would then be your strategies to, to, to prevent that, if you predict the high okay. disease rate? Um, I think, first of all, uh, information an information campaign would be the best way. So informing the people when they go to forest, take care of the ticks, 
uh, because this is, would be the first step. Um, or in the case of vaccination campaign, um, maybe I, I have to say in Austria, there's since 1980, there is a vaccination campaign on tick-borne vaccine. So we get this vaccination a bit cheaper uh, um, and um, financed by the ministry. So there's in, uh, this is in Austria. In Germany and Switzerland, I don't know it yet very well, but I think in Germany they are starting doing some vaccination campaigns, mainly forced by pharmace pharmaceutical um, um, industry but also in, the, in Switzerland. So I, from, in my opinion, is the information of the people, of the public, would be the first step. And we had the experience in 2008 when we published, uh, 18, when we published the paper on the tick borne, uh, uh, on the tick forecast. It w runs quite well in the, <laughs> in the newspapers, actually. And it was a bit different than the headlines I have shown you before, because it was really evidence-based. So the previous question got me thinking because in the United States, we have a parallel Lyme disease, yeah. uh, oak acorn mastic connection. And Lyme disease in the United States is a very kind of pernicious disease because it has some clear symptoms, but a lot of them can be misdiagnosed. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you've thought about doing an outreach campaign with doctors to make them know like that this is a high encephalitis year, so don't be cautious to diagnose that or this is going to be a low encephalitis year so be yeah. cautious have you thought about that actually yes because uh, if you maybe you remember the wheel of the hwo there is also a, a building block of the health workforce so one of my project at the moment is to uh, train the public health uh, train the doctors train the nurses to be aware of these changes to be aware of tick-borne encephalitis but also of borreliosis as well yeah so <laughs> definitely <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I have two really quick questions you're welcome <laughs> first um is the rate of TBE within ticks relatively constant from year to year, even if the number of ticks is changing a lot? Could you be, I didn't get it right. <laughs> yeah, is the, 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 the rate of TBE in the tick population, yeah. so, so the likelihood of any given tick uh, carrying the-, the They are the, correlating, the, yes. Uh, does that stay more or less the same each year or, or does it fluctuate with or against the population of ticks? Um, uh, the DBE cases in Bavaria, we only have had a look on the Bavarian cases because we had the tick population from Bavaria uh, was correlating directly actually. So if you have a tick year, we also have uh, the, the, this year or that year, year after a TBE year, yes. I guess within the ticks themselves, though, like, like uh, you mean uh, testing the ticks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, I'm no. sorry. Yeah. Um, I know my colleague Gerhard Dobler is doing this, but I don't know the results at the moment. I can give you the contact <laughs> if you want to. The second question was: Do you know if the newspapers got it right ever? Like when they said it was the year of the tick, like was it actually the year of the tick? <laughs> They say it every year, so I think uh, yeah, newspaper are quite. <laughs> I was interested in how much the numbers of ticks go up and down, um, and I can't remember what your scale was. What's the, what's the ratio between lowest year for ticks per 100 metres or something and the highest year? How much does the number of ticks change? Um, actually, I had a look. I have a, had a look into my <laughs> presentation to give you an, uh, the right numbers. Um, so, can I? Uh, you mean what is the minimum value and the maximum value of the tick density between the years? Yeah, because the seed fall drivers are varying by more than a thousandfold. Um, so, Yeah, we have yeah. It. So it's, it's, it's only varying about double. A yeah. bad year is twice as many ticks as a good year. 
Um, and yet the seed fall is varying by three or four orders of magnitude. Why is there so little response in the ticks to this really big pulse of seeds? Mm, good question, actually. <laughs> I didn't thought about it so far. Um, uh, we, here we have the annual tick number. So, and it's ranging between 150 and here the highest amount was 460. So, actually I don't know it. <laughs> but I can think about it and can come to you later on if you want to. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, I have to, the pleasure to also convey a, a compliment from online that it was a great talk and thank you for bringing animals into the picture. <laughs> then we have a question over there and then we'll end with a question by Dr. Minivata. Um, yeah, thank you. It was wonderful. Um, my question is not on ticks, but we've been earlier also talking a little bit about like this prospect of changing tree compositions in mm -hmm. European forests. And I was just wondering whether you could say something about like a public health stance on that because you also mentioned... Uh, other um, health threats um, yeah. and so is it a huge public health is it in the public health sector also um, like a huge discussion on that or what what's your impression how important uh, it is for you in this sector okay. yeah a good question and I have to be honest it's not a really big qu a question in the public health I guess so the public health um, is more or less focusing on the health outcomes. So if we have the numbers of people um, where a uh, tree is falling down, that would be more interesting than the tree composition in the forest, actually. But I'm doing my best to be push this more into the, uh, in the general speech so that people talk about it. Maybe sometimes from the left side or from the right side, but I'm doing my best. I have a question on sampling the yeah. ticks. Yeah? Um, if you do a particular way of sampling and do, you do it year by year, you definitely always have a, a relative accuracy. Yeah? But I was also wondering about the, the tick density and mast years. And I, am, I, I feel that this sampling technique might have its limits. Yes, in of course. And <laughs> how wrong is it? I mean, how, in, how, how big is the problem of the sampling technique? Because if you don't know that you don't know what you're actually doing. So has it ever been compared to really counting ticks, which I understand is not the easiest thing, or could you do eDNA studies or anything like that? Because walking with a piece of flannel through the wood seems to be interesting. <laughs> But it's funny. But you're raising a, definitely a, a very important questions, which the tick community, I would call it like this, is um, discussing for years, more or less, or decades, actually. And there are several um, projects, or have been several projects, uh, addressing uh, uh, directly this question. But and as, as we have seen for the European area, for our area, this method is the accused method we have and we can use. It always depends um, on how many ticks are in this wood or how many areas is. So for example, in Russia, there are some tick species which are more rare, so they don't go for 100 meter, they go for, I think, 400 meter if it got right. So they are, they are having different uh, techniques. And we have a colleague in Berlin who is collecting ticks or actually more or less observing ticks. He, put, uh, he has uh, one by one square meters areas, which he is fenching. And then he has, um, uh, wooden sticks and he put each uh, autumn and each spring, he put a defined number of ticks in larval or nymphal stage, waiting them for molting and then counting them when they are uh, cr uh, growing up. So he can really reproduce the number and uh, can define how many ticks 
are per life stage. And we have correlated them with uh, flagging results. He also flags around the area and they fit quite well. <laughs> but I understand your, your doubt. <laughs> we have a couple more questions. <laughs> So, so thank you for the impressive talk. Uh, we are facing actually in Europe a massive decline in beech trees affecting the old trees which are masting. Yeah. So um, according to your forecast model, is there any chance that there will be in near future less ticks um, if, if we miss these masting trees? Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> And this would be a very interesting research question, but actually I've changed my affiliation and I'm not allowed to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so... Um, I actually, I do still tick collecting, but yeah. Uh, it would be very interesting and I really hope that my colleagues, maybe France, you're doing, <laughs> and address this research question. But you're right, this changing tree composition in the forest affects also the the tick species or even all species in this forest. We have a colleague, as I mentioned in Berlin, he observed after a big uh, um, storm that the uh, tree, uh, the um, forest was completely different and this also affects the uh, tick species. So I think this is a major question we have to focus on for the next years, but Unfortunately, not my, myself. I guess we will have to frame it in terms of how many humans will be got by the ticks. So one final <laughs> short question, please, before we release you into lunch. By yeah, my question is quite related to the former one. Uh, do you know about the spatial extent of such outbreaks? I mean, beach are not everywhere. So are, are regions without beach more safe in this context? Um, and the second question would be, do you think about other uh, potential fruits for the rodents? I mean, probably oak, mothing, mm -hmm. or something like that? Okay. So, um, maybe the first, the last question. Uh, we also thought about of different uh, fruits, peach, uh, tree fruits, but uh, we decided to use the peach because it's the most common um, um, tree in the Austrian or in the German forest, in the Swiss forest. Um, as is an indicator or predictor for different um, um, tree fruits. And uh, your first question about the differences in the tick density uh, concerning the different uh, tree species. Uh, we also had another project, which I didn't show you, where we have uh, modeled the tick density over whole Germany, and we divided into different forest types. So we had the uh, green forest and the, I, I forget the word. And <laughs> we have, so you have really see, can see different structures. And you can see that um, in a beach forest, I think it's doubled uh, than to the other uh, forest. So there's really differences. And this is maybe <laughs> just the la last comment. It's because of the leaf letter. The, the ticks need a special temperature and also humidity. And in the uh, beach forest, it's the best. <laughs> they love it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Let's give a hand to Dr. Katrina Brucker and all the other speakers.